David Palandro, marine biologist. My name is Emma Stacy, and I'm a chemist. I am Dr. Asad Zidan, and I am a physiology professor. Hi, my name is Amma. I am a surgeon. My name is Istama Harik. I am a dentist, and I work in Germany. Hi, my name is Evan Wesley, and I am the vice president for student activation for the Hello, uh, my name is Sarwat al I am a neurosurgeon and working in uh, Germany since eight years. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second episode of our podcast, The Universe is Made of Stories, Not Atoms. Today, we are joined by Dr. David Palangio. Dr. Palangio, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Thanks, Shay. So my name is Dave Palandro, and I am a marine biologist. I work for ExxonMobil here in Doha, ExxonMobil Research Qatar, where I am the environmental management lead here at the research facility. And I also serve as ExxonMobil's global principal for marine environmental management, which means that I support the company during different operations around the world. Okay. And so can you tell us a little bit about what like a typical day at your job looks like or what does it mean of you being a marine biologist at ExxonMobil? Sure. So because my role is a little bit split, most of my work is based here in Qatar where we're doing different types of fundamental research and applied research. A lot of what we do is in the marine realm because I am a marine biologist. And so we work on identifying challenges to say coral reefs, seagrass and mangroves. We spend time mapping the extent of those habitats and ecosystems. Yeah. And then we try to define, are they being challenged in the natural environment? Are they degrading over time? and whether or not we can define meaningful conservation tools and meaningful conservation actions to maybe help support those ecosystems. And so we work with a variety of different partners here in Qatar, and those include Qatar Gas and Qatar Energy, Qatar University, HBKU. And so really trying to bring the best minds together here in Qatar to make sure that the research that we're doing can be applied and that we can apply the best available science to supporting natural ecosystems, again, specifically in the marine realm. Yeah. Okay. And kind of going off of that, like we often hear that coral reefs are just so important and, you know, like the drastic loss of them right now because of, you know, human activity and other things is just devastating. So can you tell us a bit more about like why coral reefs are just so important? So coral reefs are often described as the rainforests of the sea. And that's because they are home to more species and, and more genera than any other place in the ocean. They're high biodiversity areas. They provide ecosystem services to people. And by that, I mean, they provide food to people. In many cases, they provide shoreline protection around the world, and they provide opportunities for people to engage with nature. You know, as a scuba diver, I've been lucky enough to dive coral reefs all over the world. And so what we call the ecosystem service there is really for people to be out in nature. And so whether it's tourism, ecotourism or conservation, those types of ecosystems like coral reefs provide a really important link to nature. Yeah. And so they provide a, a multitude of ecosystem services, not the least of which is just, I guess, again, us connecting. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty incredible. Um, during like our research, we found that coral bleaching is you know a big problem and just like can you expand on why it's so bad? I understand that it's when algae like leave the coral reefs, I believe, but why is that so bad? Sure, sure. So let's let's talk a little bit about the science first. So coral is an animal. Mm -hmm. And so although a lot of folks think that they're plants because they don't move, they're not. Corals are animals. And so think about a jellyfish upside down where the tentacles stick up. Yeah. And so jellyfish and corals are related. They're both what are called cnidaria. 
And coral as an animal, as an evolutionary strategy, is able to use those tentacles to feed. In most places where corals thrive, there isn't enough of a food source for them to grow. And so most corals that thrive in shallow water have what are called zooxanthellae. And that's the symbiotic algae that live inside the cells of the coral. Yeah. And so if anybody's ever studied that symbiosis, the coral provides a home to the algae. And in turn, the algae provides energy and food to the coral. And so when you look at a coral, for example, a living coral polyp, which is the single animal, is clear. And the skeleton, which are the dead coral polyps, are white. They're just like chalk, calcium carbonate. And so when you see the coral, the beautiful color that corals provide, that's from that algae living in their cells. Oh. And so exactly to your point, what happens during bleaching events is that the symbiotic algae, that zooxanthellae, exits the coral animal. And there's still a little scientific discussion as to whether the coral expels them mm -hmm. or the algae kind of leaves on their own. And there's a different conversation there. But at the end of the day, what happens is you're left with a clear coral animal and it's called bleaching because you can see through the living coral tissue and all you see is the calcium carbonate skeleton from the previous coral polyps. That's why it's called bleaching. Wow. They basically turn white. That's the color that you see. So bleaching can occur and has been documented over several decades. And so it occurs through any environmental perturbation or impact to the corals. However, bleaching today in 2022, in the past several years, has been linked to thermal stress. Okay. And that means that as the oceans are in a warming process, the corals undergo a stress and it's thermal stress, it's heat related. And because of that, they bleach. And several years ago, a lot of the bleachings that occurred were in the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea. Yeah. But now we're seeing bleaching almost on an annual basis around the world. And because the algae, the zooxanthellae provide food and energy to the coral, essentially those corals that are bleached lose that energy. They lose that input of food. And oftentimes that leads to the demise of the coral animal. Not always, but very often so. And so that's why bleaching is such a problem for corals around the world. And so does that mean that like human activity is connected to it because they're raising ocean temperatures? So it's interesting that you asked that. And, and I think that the short answer is yes, but it's a bit more complex than that. But there are links between human activities and impacts to corals, no question. Okay. And there have been, unfortunately, for not just in the past couple of decades, but really for centuries. And so it's really interesting if you ever want to know how a coral reef got its name, in many cases, it got its name because it's the name of the boat that hit it. Oh. <laughs> and that's not recent history, but that goes back a long time. And so the coral reefs where I did my research are in Florida, in the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. And many of the reefs that I worked on were named after the boat that hit it. <laughs> so unfortunately, when navigation charts were, were less robust and less mature and less exact mm -hmm. of vessels often ran aground on coral reefs. Wow, that's a pretty interesting fact that I didn't know. <laughs> is the coral reef in Qatar specifically declining and is it related to coral bleaching or, yeah? It's a great question. And so corals in Qatar are often defined as in decline. Yeah. Again, there is no single reason. Bleaching is one of them. And what's really interesting about the corals here in Qatar is that they're already at the thermal extent of where corals exist in the world. Oh. Because the Arabian Gulf is so warm anyway. Right. That we're just starting, well, I should say that. We do see bleaching in the Arabian Gulf around Qatar, but scientists are actually looking at the reefs around Qatar and around the Arabian Gulf because they really are unique around the world. And it's because those corals historically have been very healthy and thrive in the thermal extent, the, the higher temperatures because the Arabian Gulf is so warm and higher salinities that exist. And so certain scientists believe that the corals that exist in the Arabian Gulf may 
help support other corals around the world if ocean temperatures continue to rise. So there might be an opportunity to have the corals that are found in the Arabian Gulf potentially populate other places in the world. Okay, so like, do you think like they're more adapted to like withstand higher temperatures or is that still like their limits? Like they can't go beyond that? So they are, so they, they are historically more adapted to the higher temperatures and higher salinity or saltiness. Okay. However, we are seeing thermal stress induced bleaching on the corals here in Qatar. Okay. And is part of your job, I think you mentioned this at the start, but like taking measures to prevent it from happening in Qatar and like restoring the coral reefs here? Yes. So yes, part of my job is looking at, well, trying to understand what's causing decline in corals. Yeah. Including thermal stress and then coming up with conservation ideas that would support greater growth of corals. So that is part of my job working, you know, certainly with the various partners in Qatar, certainly the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change and supporting their endeavor of conservation of the natural ecosystems of Qatar. So some of the work we're looking at is understand historically where have corals been most prominent and the healthiest and looking at change over time. And one of the ways that we do that is we use satellite data. And so we'll use satellite data to map coral reefs. And we're working on a project right now that is mapping coral reefs around Qatar for 2022. And ExxonMobil Research Qatar has done historic mapping dating as far back as 2016. And so the idea is going to be to assess those two different time periods and see where potentially corals are growing okay. and where potentially corals are in decline. And then try to what they call attribute or understand why those changes are occurring, positive and negative. And then this is kind of going back a bit to something you said before, you mentioned like that coral reefs in Qatar, because they can withstand such high temperatures, they can help support coral reefs in other areas. Can you explain more about how that is? Like would that specific species like be um, moved to other areas or, you know, like, can you expand more on that? Sure. So what different scientists are looking at, and, and this is not something that we're doing here at EMRQ, yeah. but what certain scientists are looking at is they're trying to understand why the corals in the Arabian Gulf are better suited to the higher temperatures and higher salinities. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the zooxanthellae, which are the symbiotic algae that live within the coral. Yeah. Those are further broken down into what are called claves. Don't worry too much about that, but there are different types. And so the idea would be to understand what makes the coral species in the Arabian Gulf better suited to those high temperatures, for example, even though some of those other species also exist in other locations. Yeah. So the species that exist in the Gulf in many ways are, are spread in other places around the world. So understanding where in the world those species might exist and then making sure, understanding that the algae that's related to those species are they different in those different locations? And so it's really understanding not only the corals, but the zooxanthellae or the symbiotic algae at the same time. And so that's what scientists are looking at to understand how they react differently to different thermal temperature gradients. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Okay, now it's kind of like turning to another topic that you mentioned that you you know, work with. Um, so you talked about like seagrass and the gongs. And in our research, we found that there was this quote that seagrass ecosystems with the gongs indicate a healthy ecosystem. And can you, do you know like why that is? Can you explain that a little bit more? What's the relationship there? So it goes a little bit of two ways and it's not quite a symbiotic relationship, but it's a mutual relationship. And so where you have seagrass and especially dense, so a high population of seagrass, for example, right? Here in the Arabian Gulf and here in Qatar, dugong will come and eat the seagrass. And so seagrass is their number one food source. Mm -hmm. Actually, their primary food source. And the value that dugong provide to seagrass is, well, when you eat something, it tends to come out the other end at some point. And so that actually tends to be fertilizer for more seagrass. Oh, okay. And at the same time, seagrass ecosystems on their own are actually they're maybe they're not as they don't have as high biodiversity as corals have but seagrasses themselves provide again really important ecosystem services they provide 
food for dugong, right? They provide food for other fishes and invertebrates like crabs and lobsters and other things. They provide shelter for small fish and small invertebrates. They help stabilize the sand or the sediment, right? So if you think about on land in Qatar and you think about where you see sand and you, on a windy day, you'll see that sand shift around, right? Yeah. But where you have trees and grass on land, it stabilizes that sediment, that soil. Oh. Well, in the water, seagrass does the exact same thing. It stabilizes that sediment and holds it fast, holds it steady. And so seagrass all by itself provides a number of services to the environment that we don't always think about. So we see, we, we often get very excited when we see the dugong, of course, because they're amazing animals. Yeah. And they're so iconic for Qatar. Yeah. But even their food source provides a real value to the marine ecosystem through food, through protection, through habitat, through sediment maintenance. They, you know, it's really important. And, and sometimes seagrass gets overlooked because we see the cool looking animal, the dugong. Yeah. I don't know if this is like a, a silly or obvious question, but like, why is it so important that the sand stays stabilized, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. It's not silly at all. And so the reality is the sand being stabilized is really more for humans than it is for the environment because the environment is always changing. Yeah. And that's not too big of a deal it, because the environment will often adapt to the shifting of the sands. But when you think about how humans use the coastline, and you know whether it be construction or beaches or just being out on a boat you know you're looking for stability and, and the seagrasses provide that shoreline stability in many places uh, it also helps minimize the word is turbidity or how murky how mixed the water sees and again that's a bit more for people than anything else because we like clear water that's pretty interesting that they do something that helps humans more than animals Yep, and it helps both, right? So that's what's really interesting. And so I keep using this word ecosystem services, right? And that's, those are the services that different ecosystems provide. Yeah. And so oftentimes they're provided to the environment around them or to humans. Yeah. Are seagrass in decline like coral reefs? And is that connected to human activities? Not in a significant way. It's much more regional and local when you talk about seagrasses. Seagrasses have the ability to grow relatively quickly, but they also may decline very quickly versus corals, which take a bit more time to do both. And so when you look globally at seagrass, well, let me start here. When you look locally at seagrass in Qatar, Qatar has some very healthy and thriving seagrass beds. Okay, that's good. That's why we, that's why we have the dugong, amongst other reasons. However, in certain places around the world, you do see local impacts or regional impacts to seagrass, but we also have the ability to rectify that problem. And, and so one of the examples I like to use again is back in Florida where I used to live. Mm -hmm. In Tampa Bay, Florida, there was a significant decline in seagrass coverage in Tampa Bay. That challenge was recognized. The reason for its decline was recognized and the government and its partners and the stakeholders including the universities and, and the one i went to worked very very hard to bring that seagrass back and so it's actually a success story where in tampa bay florida they brought back significant seagrass ecosystems and so yes it's a challenge around the world and it, or it can be a challenge around the world but seagrass beds we have the ability to bring them back relatively quickly okay that's that's good that's good Okay, I'm going to move on to another topic now. I, I'm really interested in talking about your scuba diving experience. <laughs> <laughs> so how often do you do scuba diving research? Or I don't know, just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So I'm happy to talk about that. So I'll start from the beginning. I got scuba certified just after high school when I first started university. Yeah. So I've been certified for quite a long time. I'm currently an instructor. And I've actually, I've done a, several thousand dives around the world under different kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what I do is I do what's called expedition diving, where I go quite deep for quite long. And I use specialized equipment for that. So it's called a closed circuit rebreather. So a little different from blowing bubbles, which is typically what you get with a scuba tank. 
These don't make any bubbles. They're, you recirculate your air that you breathe in and out. So that's me as a diver, but more importantly, I really started to dive when I was at university and working my degree in marine biology because it became part of my job. In order for me to understand coral reef ecosystems, I had to go scuba diving on them to truly understand them, to take measurements, to take water samples, to take coral samples, or even sometimes just to take pictures and video. Mm -hmm. So that's really when I started diving much more actively. And so a lot of my, a lot of the scuba dives that I've done, I typically had a camera in my hand or a piece of equipment to take information. So they haven't all been like vacation dives, although I've done a good amount of those too. I currently don't do a lot of research diving anymore. I work with other groups and have them collect the information for me, which makes me a little bit sad. <laughs> But I've done research dives in Florida, as I said earlier. I've done dives in Australia, the Bahamas. I've been able to do them in a lot of really, really cool places. And so the fact is I chose corals for a reason to, do, to be my focal point. It's because I always wanted to be in warm, clear water. And coral reefs really in shallow water only thrive, only exist in shallow, warm, clear water. And so most of the scuba diving I've done has aligned with the coral ecosystems. But those who like the ocean, scuba diving is the best way to see what you don't usually get to see underneath. So did you get the scuba diving degree for your job or was it separate interests that joined? It started as a separate interest. Okay. And so it started as just, I've always been a marine person, even where I grew up in the US, I grew up on an island. And so there was always water around me. Okay. So being on boats and driving boats and being underwater always became second nature to me. And so it started out as, I guess, as a passion that I was able to turn into a career. Mm -hmm. That's pretty nice to have something that you're so passionate about. An odd question, but can you send us some pictures, like the closed pictures you have? And then we're going to be posting this podcast both on Spotify and YouTube. But on YouTube, we'll like, we can like put in some of the pictures. So would you mind doing that? Not a problem. I'll send you some great underwater pictures. Okay, thank you. So the next question. So when you do scuba diving research or when you do it, do you like usually go with a particular goal in mind or you just kind of like want to scope things and just take pictures or I don't know, things like that? So it's a good question. And usually, so if I'm diving for research, that research always has an objective. Yeah. And so one of the things we very often used to do is we would map something called a percent coral cover, right? So we would identify a reef or several reefs that we want to understand better. And we would go to that site, we would lay out a meter tape. And so a meter tape is just a measuring tape. In our case, they would tend to be 50 meters or 100 meters long. And so they're on a reel. So we always dive in a team. And so what would often happen is the first person in would roll out the meter tape. Yeah. And then the second person in would either have a clipboard underwater. Yeah. With a pencil and underwater paper and would be taking notes at different intervals along that meter tape transect. It's called a, a, a transect. Or we would take still photographs. If we were looking again to look at that percent coral cover, we can derive coral cover. So living coral tissue from those photographs. Oh. Um, or we would be taking underwater video. So a video camera looking straight down at the bottom of the ocean of the corals and the mix of corals and sea fans and soft corals and algae and other things. And then what we do, we would do what's called post-processing. And so we'd bring all that information back into our lab and we would run the video. And then we would again pull out, say, percent coral cover. We would look at, are the corals diseased? Are they healthy? Can we do change over time? And so that's a lot of what we would do specific to corals because we're trying to document their health. Okay. And when we're able to do that, and if we see changes, that's what allows us to then go back and say, is this a healthy ecosystem? And if it's not a healthy ecosystem, try to understand why it's not a healthy ecosystem. And potentially the end goal is oftentimes, is there something we can do to support a stronger, healthy ecosystem? Okay, what was your favorite experience with scuba diving? Or like the coolest one? Well, I've got a few. <laughs> one of them is the first time my entire family was together scuba diving. Yeah. So my son is 21, my daughter is 17 and goes to ASD, and my wife is also certified. Yeah. 
And so it was a few years ago where all of us were underwater together for the first time, all in our scuba gear. Oh, that's, that's a pretty cool So that was, that was a great memory for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, I also work with a couple of nonprofits, and one of which I helped create with a couple of mates, where we work with uh, middle school and high school students, students to teach them marine science. So one year we were asked to support a government initiative where we were diving at night looking for coral spawning. Mm -hmm. So some corals reproduce by what's called spawning. And so we were diving on a site and we actually witnessed the corals spawn. And I had a bunch of uh, teenagers with me who were willing to dive all night and I couldn't get them out of the water. I was, really, <laughs> I was proud of those guys because they stayed with science safely, always safely. Yeah. But uh, they didn't want to go home. They didn't want to go to bed that night. Yeah. I mean, I would relate like that's that's a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. And then the last one is a bit more selfish. <laughs> Myself and, and a really good mate of mine, another expedition diver. We were fortunate enough to go to an island in the South Pacific that has a lot of World War II shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a couple of weeks diving on those shipwrecks and on the outside, on the inside, and really a unique piece of history that not everyone gets to see. That's so cool. That's really cool. Oh my God. Wait, where was that again? So that was a place called Chuk or Truck Lagoon, and it's in the South Pacific. Oh, that's really cool, actually. Oh my God. <laughs> like something <laughs> out of a movie. <laughs> it was really, again, it was a little selfish, but <laughs> certainly one of my most, my, some of my most memorable dives yeah. were in very deep waters inside some of these World War II shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then have you ever had like any like close calls or a scary scuba diving experience? There's been a couple. Thankfully, you know, good planning, good teamwork has gotten us safely out of those. But I remember a time we were uh, we had placed some underwater temperature sensors in fairly deep water, so I guess about 80 or 85 meters deep. Yeah. Which requires a very, again, it requires another set of skills for scuba diving and, and certain certifications. And it was a drift dive, which means that the boat drops you in one place and picks you up in another place. And so multiple challenges, multiple complications, but nothing that myself and my dive partner hadn't done before. And so we dropped into the water, we started our descent, and everything was going really, really well. And we actually missed the structure that we had our temperature loggers on to retrieve. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, that happens. It's not really a big deal. Yeah. But when you're diving that deep, you're kind of done for the day. And so we communicated underwater. We said, okay, we're done. We're not going to get back to that boat. Let's go ahead and surface and we'll get our folks to pick us up. And as we're surfacing, both of us seem to have the recollection at the very same time that we were diving amongst a bunch of bull sharks. Oh. <laughs> um, and it's something we didn't think about on the way down because it really wasn't an issue. But as we were coming back up, I think we both had the realization that, ooh, saw the bull sharks in the water when we came down. And at the bottom, it wasn't an issue. As we started coming up, we started seeing them again and they were feeding. <laughs> Oh, which makes oh, it a no. head more dangerous. And the reality is, is that we weren't in real danger, but it wasn't the safest place to be. Yeah, I guess so. So, safe. yeah, so we surfaced well, and, and it took us 20 minutes to surface because of the diving technical components. But it, we got on the boat, we kind of looked at each other like, let's not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> we actually didn't go back to that site for two more months. Oh. Um, we, we spoke <laughs> locals a local operator because we were using our agency boat and he said no i never take divers out there this time of year too many bull sharks oh okay so it was a great lesson learned for us yeah <laughs> that's pretty scary <laughs> um okay now i'm going to move on to like career questions just stuff i'm curious about but like how you became um in marine biologist and stuff so i think you actually might have covered this a little bit like why did you decide to go into marine biology like was it because of your scuba diving interest like was that related to that or if it was it was a bit broader than that i've always wanted to be in and around the sea mm -hmm. and so marine biology was the most logical thing for me to do and i started out as just a biology major in college and university yeah and I was fortunate enough to get the opportunities to expand my knowledge on the marine side. And so I did an undergraduate university degree in biology and history, took a little time off to find myself and travel and play rugby and go scuba diving on my own time. 
Uh, and then I went back to graduate school and I have a, I was able to get my master's degree and my PhD, my doctorate in marine science. Okay. And it was really driven by, again, me just always wanting to have a job that kept me close to the sea. Yeah. Okay, and there's more like, I guess for the students listening out there about like the process. So after you got your master's and stuff, how do you get job experience? Because I know like a lot of jobs, they don't hire people unless they have experience, but then it's like, well, how do you get experience? Is it like you did it through internships or, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So actually, well, I'm a little bit older, so you have to take that into account, but I didn't do any internships. Okay. What I did was when I started my master's, I just, I did everything I could to work with my professors. I took every opportunity I could to gain experience, mm -hmm. but I was kind of already in the system, right? Oh, okay. But I will say what happened was because I was willing to go to sea for weeks at a time and do different types of things that maybe weren't directly related to the work I wanted to do, yes. that opened up a lot of really unique opportunities for me and it allowed me to really hone in on what I wanted to do and maybe what I didn't want to do in the marine field. Okay. But by my willingness to do those things, other professors asked me to do other work for them. And so scuba diving is one of those great examples because I had already been a scuba diver, because I had already logged a bunch of dives, I was able to do some other things that some of the other students initially weren't able to do. And that opened up a bunch of opportunities for me. Okay, and then to end the podcast, our last question is, what's your favorite thing about your job and what is the most difficult part of it? Great questions. So I really like to engage with people mm -hmm. and I really like to share my knowledge with people. And, and sometimes that's very formal and very stuffy through the science world and writing papers or giving scientific presentations. But I like to engage with other scientists and I like to work really challenging problems. Mm -hmm. And so to be fair, that's actually why I work in industry now. I worked in government and I worked at the university and I've, so I've kind of covered all the bases. Some of the most challenging problems are actually are in industry and so i really like tackling those challenges yeah which at the same time leads to some of my hardest work <laughs> there's a reason why those challenges are difficult and sometimes they're global and sometimes they're local mm -hmm. but it's a little bit of a two-edged sword right it's yeah things i really enjoy doing are tackling difficult challenges <laughs> but they're pretty difficult challenges sometimes <laughs> it means that it takes months to years Oh. Or something. I've never answered those questions and I really enjoy working with others to try to answer those types of things. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This conversation was really interesting and I really enjoyed it. So again, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.